I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Pat from Sabaton. And, and this, this is Sabaton, Sabaton History. History. Even in the depths of the inhumanity of World War II, you still find stories of humanity and even honor between the two sides. Yeah, and thanks to the American author Adam Marcus, we found out about the story about No Bullets Fly. And that's a story I'm going to tell you right now, and then Paris is going to tell you about the song. It's hard to describe if you see an airplane that's so, so crippled, and for me it would have been the same as shooting at a parachute. I just couldn't shoot. December 20th, 1943, days before Christmas and snowflakes spatter the windshield of Ye Old Pub, an American B-17 bomber flying 20,000 feet above the North Sea. It's part of an eight mile long bomber stream on its way to Northern Germany. Their target, a Focke Wolf aircraft factory in the city of Bremen. Piloting a flying fortress, as the B-17s are known, for the first time is Charlie Brown who has the lives of 10 young men of the 379th Bombardment Group in his hands. They ready their 12 500-pound bombs. This month, the Americans will drop over 2.6 million pounds of bombs onto German industrial and military targets. Shortly after 11 a.m., they cross the German border, nervously on the lookout for enemy fighters. Because if they can see Germany, so too can the German spotters see them and calculate their height, speed, and intended destination. Covering them as escorts are P-47 Thunderbolts, whose job it is to intercept the enemy. At 11.30, puffs of black smoke appear all over. German 88mm flak cannons are opening up, sending 20-pound shells into the air. Each has a differently timed fuse, so they explode at different altitudes. The explosions rock the pub, and Charlie can barely see a thing through the smoke. Suddenly, a red flash explodes right before his eyes. The plexiglass nose of the plane is sheared off and smashes against the windshield. The men up front are unhurt, but ice-cold winds now stream through the plane. The outside air temperature is minus 60 Celsius. The shelling continues. Another red flash and engine number two is dead. Another shell goes straight through the left wing before exploding further above. And on the right, engine number four is damaged and spins wildly out of control. Charlie fights the controls to keep it from ripping off the wing. But yet another shell rips through the roof. Charlie's main focus, though, is now on keeping the plane straight as the command to drop the bombs comes over through the radio. The pub gives a big kick as the heavy cargo falls on the smoking city down below. It's time to head home. The bomber formation turns back towards the North Sea. But the danger hasn't passed. They are still over enemy territory. Charlie's crew frantically scan the sky for enemy fighters, but the sky is empty of them. Not just the enemies, though, also their own. Look to the right, then look again. Now, none of the bombers have made the run unscathed, but the pub and the bomber beside them are seriously damaged. Charlie can see that the other plane is in bad shape, smoke pouring from two engines and dangerously losing height. The pub itself stays up, but is reduced to two functional engines, and both planes have fallen way behind as their formation has flown on ahead. The other plane dives to try and put out its fire. It disappears behind some clouds, and suddenly a red flash catches Charlie's eyes. The other plane is gone. His co-pilot cries out. Dark gray shapes appear on the horizon. It's a squadron of focke Wolf 190s closing fast. At the same time, a group of Messerschmitt 190s leap through the clouds below where the other B-17 has just disappeared. Charlie's men ready their machine guns as the two lead 190s aim for the pub's cockpit to take out the pilot and the controls in one attack. But Charlie turns and flies full speed toward the attackers, only presenting them the narrowest target while also shortening the distance between them. That catches the attackers off guard and their bullets miss the cockpit and bounce off the plane's roof. Charlie's top gunner returns fire and hits a 190. It banks off on fire. The second 190 is hit by the nose gunner while trying to avoid collision. The Flying Fortress still has some fight in it. Now the 109s close from behind. The tail gunner tries to spin his guns. And nothing happens. The gun is frozen. Literally frozen. 
the winds blowing through the plane have now frozen the oiled gun. The attackers close in, the tail gunner signals Charlie, and he jerks the plane into a steep dive. Bullets ricochet off the frame, penetrating the glass of the ball turret beneath the plane and cutting off half of the rudder. The radio operator calls out for help, but gets only static. Bullets have pierced the radio. 20 millimeter shells have punched through the plane and severely wounded many crew members. The tail gunner is now dead, and all of them are affected by the frost. Charlie fights just to keep the ruin of his plane in the air. Only one gun is still operable. Another attack, and the cockpit is hit, puncturing Charlie's oxygen tank. Tipping to the left, the bomber spirals out of control. Faster and faster, it spirals downwards. Gasping for air, Charlie tries to get control, but the loss of the rudder makes that virtually impossible. Upside down, Charlie's vision fades. As the bomber plunges towards the city of Oldenburg, Charlie comes to. The lower altitude has more oxygen. Immediately, he hauls on the controls, fighting the plane with all of his strength. At just 3,000 feet, under 1,000 meters, he pulls it out of its dive. Right above the houses of Oldenburg, the plane is even close enough to shear shingles off the roofs. Charlie manages to pull the plane back up. At least what's left of it. Most of the crew is wounded or unconscious, only able now to fly 135 miles per hour, 217 kilometers per hour. To escape back to England, they will have to break through the German lines again, the dreaded Atlantic Wall, Germany's fortified coastline with the best anti-aircraft gunners in the world. Charlie makes clear that anyone can choose to bail out. Being a POW is still better than being shot to pieces, but his men refuse. Eyes fixed to the north, they fly past the Jever airfield, where German fighter ace Franz Stiegler is about to start his engine. Just a day earlier, he brought down a B-17, and shooting down another one makes him eligible for the Knight's Cross. To Franz, though, this medal means more than just an award for being a killing machine. It means that there is sense behind his fighting, and that he has done his duty for his countrymen. He has seen firsthand what the bombers have done to cities like Hamburg and Bremen, reducing them to rubble. But his fight is not about hatred or revenge, it's about duty and survival. Franz Stiegler learned his craft during his service in the Libyan desert, where he flew with the Knights of the Desert and their star flighter ace Hans Joachim Marseille. He has lost a brother to the war, he has seen the destruction of the Africa Corps, and then was caught up in the desperate fight for Sicily under Adolf Galland. He would earn his Knight's Cross by shooting down the flying fortress that appears now before him. He begins his attack run. But with his finger on the trigger and the enemy rear in sight, he does not shoot. Something stops him, a feeling that something is not right. The lack of fire from the other plane makes him curious, and it is then he spots the damage the enemy plane has taken. He flies closer and pulls up alongside. Stunned by the condition of the plane and how it is still able to even fly, the only gun not destroyed is the ball turret below, but it cannot elevate its guns high enough to harm Stiegler. I saw the tail gunner wasn't there because the guns were hanging down. Half the tail was missing on the, on the left hand side, practically no tail at all. Franz knows that a few shots are enough to bring this contraption down, but there is little glory to him in shooting down a bunch of helpless men even though their bombs have quite likely just killed his countrymen. He draws up right by the pub's cockpit. Now, Charlie's eyes are still fixed on the horizon, thinking of the flat guns of the Atlantic Wall, when suddenly a Messerschmitt appears right next to him. Imagine how that felt. I look out the right window, and there parked on my right wing is a German BF-109. And so I sort of closed my eyes and shook my head as you would with a nightmare, and if I close my eyes and open them again, he'll be gone. Well, I opened them again, and he was still there. Well, Franz waves at Charlie and points down, signaling that they should land, knowing that they stand no chance against the Atlantic Wall. Charlie shakes his head, and Franz knows that they are dead men unless he helps them.
so he stays with them as they fly towards the Atlantic Wall. See, the experienced German spotters on the ground will easily recognize one of their own. So as they fly across the AA guns, not a single one opens fire. Franz will wonder his whole life what the spotters think of that scene in the sky that day. As they pass unscathed, Charlie does not understand nor see what Franz has done to help him until Franz Stiegler salutes, then banks away. And only as he salutes does Charlie understand. The pub makes it back to England, barely, and it is a small miracle that it manages a landing. The commanding officer is about to award them medals for their service this day, but High Command gets wind of the story, how a German fighter pilot saved their lives, and High Command is furious. No one can know that the mission never happened. Everything is swept under the rug. Charlie and his crew are outraged, but that is that. Franz lands safely near Bremen, but he as well can tell no one what he has just done. This could get him court-martialed. Well, it could get him killed. If someone had seen him and reported him, it could have been a death sentence, a double. So he had the double impact. Well, the story may have just disappeared into the mists of time. But according to the book A Higher Call, in 1985, Boeing invited old fighter pilots to the 50th anniversary of the B-17. His first flights were back in 1935. Franz Stiegler was by then living in Vancouver, Canada. He was in attendance as pretty much the only German pilot and was interviewed by a local TV station and he told his story. Charlie, the same year, wrote to that old German flying ace Adolf Galland and the German magazine Jagerblatt trying to find out who his German savior was. It took until 1990 until they truly found each other and met in person after letters and phone calls. Their startling story got worldwide attention. But you know, even after that, even so long after the war, Franz would receive calls from Germany calling him a traitor, while some Canadian neighbors shunned him as a Nazi. Franz always responded, they would never understand. Franz, what were your feelings when you met again for the well, first time? I was so happy as we met that I dropped him on top of him. It wasn't easy. It was like meeting a family member, a brother that you haven't seen for 40 years. That's about as close as I can come. So how did you hear this story in the first place? As usual, we are looking on the internet for ideas all the time. And I stumbled about a very beautiful picture, which is a, a painting of two airplanes. And the picture is the front cover artwork of a book written by an American author called Adam Makos from Valor Studios. Right. When, when I saw this picture, I was like, what's the story behind it? Right. And then starting to read and it was like, wow, this is a great story. And this is something we can do a song about. When we released the song, it was really interesting that I was contacted by a woman called Jovita Stiegler. Stiegler. Okay. And this is obviously the daughter of Franz Stiegler. Franz Stiegler. She wrote to me saying that her son, who's a fan of Sabaton, just found out that we wrote a song about his, his grandfather. grandfather. Wow. Uh. We had just announced a tour where we were traveling in North America. And uh, her family was based in Vancouver, in Canada. Okay. And as we arrived there, we met with them. That's really awesome, though. It's it's. Uh, I I love the the little bits of these stories, like when you met Audie Murphy's family. You know, when you meet the descendants and stuff. I yeah. like that. It, it's when our songs become so personal, yeah. and uh, when we get emotional about them, because we also know that what we are doing is the right thing to do. Right. The song No Bullets Fly is from the album Heroes. Right. And here we are referring to Franz Stiegler because he had the opportunity to shoot down an enemy. But he didn't because, yeah. And that is heroism. You don't, you don't need your medals. Just that is, that is the essence of honor. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's No Bullets Fly. And this is Sabaton History. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the Sabaton History channel, check out World War II, Time Ghost, and don't forget to support the Patreon because that's really what makes this happen.